It is Friday, April 8th. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back, everyone. It was uh, more of a quiet week this time around, which is kind of a nice change of pace, considering that since the start of this year, there's been so much happening, which um, is good, but always nice to have some uh, breathers in between. And uh, that's kind of what we saw this week. But still, some things to go over. So first, as always, our PS Plus reminder, the April games are now available. Go ahead and add them to your library. And also for PS Now, we have the April lineup as well. And this is really one of the last times or the penultimate uh, time, right? The second to last to where we'll have a PS Now update that it will be called a PlayStation Plus, uh, at least extra tier, right? But either way, we have our uh, April lineup, which includes uh, Outer Wilds, then WRC 10, Werewolf the Apocalypse, Earthblood, and Journey to the Savage Planet. So not bad actually, only four games, but that's uh, you know typical for PS Now. At least they're good games, but um, yeah, this will be one of the last times where we actually call it PS Now. Come June, it'll be PS Plus Essential, Extra, and Premium, where I assume we will still get monthly updates for at least Extra and Premium, so we can do updates here on you know what those games are. So I hope that those are going to be updated monthly because right now we know that you know for certain at least Essential, which is currently PS Plus as we know today that will still have um, the monthly two free games, which, yes, the wording is a bit strange there. We didn't talk about this in the announcement video or during um, last week's episode, but, yeah, that's a bit weird. Uh, but it's, a uh, you know, keep in mind, it's uh, rather inconsistent with PS Plus games in that, well, technically right now, um, if you're only on PS4, then you're only getting two games, but there's nothing stopping you from, say, claiming the PS5 one, and then at some point you'll be able to play it um, on PS5. It feels like three games because a PS5 can play PS4 games. There's that whole mess, of course, and then there's the fact that sometimes we get bonus titles, uh, bonus PSVR games that a lot of people can't play. So um, we'll have to wait until June to see if it's really getting knocked down to two titles or if it's, say, still three, but one's considered a bonus, you know, PS5 title, right? It's kind of weird how they worded that. Um, you never know with Sony, but I would assume it's going to stay the same as we know today. But, um, you know, there's that. And, well, this is a good segue to our next story, which is about what happened over the weekend. So this was on Saturday or Sunday, but it was uh, over on Twitter. Wario64 posted a uh, another deal, which, for those that don't know, Wario64 is a Twitter account that posts a bunch of uh, video game deals and um i believe this was the uh the first place that actually posted this but he uh, had put up two links to the ps store on desktop uh through the us and uk and i think uh, a few other territories this was also working but you could still subscribe to ps now on a yearly basis which means you would get ps plus premium at half off remember during the announcement um sony actually took down on the on psn directly so right on the console they took it down almost immediately where you cannot subscribe on a you know three month or a yearly basis. You can only do month to month now. The reason for that, of course, is that if you are a PS Now subscriber, you're getting moved into premium once the tier change uh, takes effect, right? And that's why this was actually a really good deal. Um, you know, when we had rumors about the service actually finally getting revamped, uh, we saw that uh, what well, we had that report about in the UK, uh, cards are being taken down, the base the basic PS Now uh, retail cards. And when that story came up, a lot of people were saying, well, wait a minute, they've uh, been removing those for a while here in North America. Um, which, uh, a little aside, but depending on where you live, uh, your local grocery store might actually still have some where that's kind of a place where you know, they didn't get the memo or they don't really care or whatever, right? So that's not really a place where most people go and buy those kind of cards. So they might still have uh, yearly PS Now cards might be worth picking up at least one or two of them because that's what that's what happened here is that a lot of people uh, took this deal, right? They uh, bought a few years of PS Now so that you're stacked up for three, four, five years, possibly longer, and you're getting PS Plus Premium at half off because we expect that once the uh, service uh, shakeup happens, you're getting those entire years converted to PS Premium automatically. Um, but the thing is, with, there's a lot of unknowns there's a lot of things we don't know just yet, right? So a lot of people are asking questions, you know, how's it going to work? The only thing we know is that PS Now is going into premium. The reason for that, though, is because if you were only subscribed to PS Now, you were only paying, say, here in the U.S., uh, $60 to get streaming functionality, you know, six to 800-something games, right? Um, and now you're losing that option because all those features are getting moved into a higher tier that costs $120 a year. So that's why PS Now is getting moved into that higher service. 
Um, and that's where Sony's also letting people know, like, you know, if you don't want to agree to the new terms or whatever, you can, um, you know, cancel before your upcoming uh, recharge, right? So that's why um, initially all the uh, one year options were removed automatically. And that's why people were jumping on this deal. Um, so now it appears that there's no way to actually do this. Um, and we, we still don't know how they're going to handle if you have, say, PS Now for a year, but you have PS Plus for three years, I would assume that you'll just lose premium and get knocked down to essential because, you know, they didn't outline this, but they're clearly going to have a way to prorate you up. The whole goal of this service change is to have existing users subscribe upwards. So if you're currently a subscriber, you're going to have that option to, say, go up to extra premium for what I would assume is just the difference of what you would have to pay. Um, so we'll see what happens. But between now and June, you don't really have many options anymore because uh, this exploit is gone. You can't do it on the console. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure CD Keys has been out for a bit. So it's something where uh, if an opportunity does come up again, I would say grab at least a year. Sure, it sounds strange to do, um, you know, four or five years plus for a service where we don't have the full lineup and all the, all the details. But uh, the thing is, if you're going to do at least a year, that's where it's the same price as PS Plus. Uh, so if you already know you're going to be a PS Plus member, why not pay the same price? And then you can also test out the, the, the entire uh, premium lineup and then make the decision at the end of the year if you want to keep paying $120 and if that, you know, if, if it's worth it more or less. Now, while we're talking about PS Plus Premium, good time for our next story. Uh, of course, the biggest point of PS Plus Premium or the biggest uh, talking point has been the PS3 streaming, no emulation. Why? Why won't Sony do it? This, that, and the other. We've done it so many times here, but recently we've seen that uh, Games Beat reporter Jeff Grubb mentioned during an episode of Games Beat Decides that uh, he's heard that Sony might be working on emulation on PlayStation 5. He says, and I quote here, since talking about this all week, I've looked, I've asked, it sounds like Sony might be working on emulation for PS3 on PS5. It may take some time. Now, I want to really uh, reiterate this here, not only for Jeff Grubb's sake, but also for my own skepticism where he says, I've looked, I've asked, it sounds like Sony might be working on emulation for PS3 on PS5. It may take some time. And that certainly is the, uh, the caveat that I've added to this conversation anytime we do touch on it, which is that, okay, let's say they do it it's not gonna be, it's gonna take a very long time, right? So the counter arguments we've, we've always seen over the years is our PCS3 and also their closest competitor, Microsoft. Um, for the Microsoft example, they started this work in 2011, right? Now, it wasn't actually the entire time that they worked on it, so it actually, it began in 2011 where they put in some sort of emulation layer uh, baked onto Xbox One Silicon, if I can remember correctly. Um, then it actually, like, it died down or something, then they, they didn't pursue it. 2014 is when they restarted the program internally, then 2015 they announced. 2016, uh, they finally launched with the initial wave of titles, which we saw that it was a monetized program, as in they don't let you play everything, right? They only had a, a small selection of games, and over time they did, you know, make it better, and now they're up to, you know, 500-something, uh, no, what, what is it, 600-something, 360 games, uh, I can't remember the, the final count exactly, but it, now they're up to, you know, a few hundred uh, 360 games, and for original Xbox, it was like 50-something, or 39 to 50-something games, obviously it's not a whole lot, right, and that's why I always found it a bit strange to call it, you know, backwards compatibility when not only is it not nearly as large of a library as people think it is, but it's also something where when you use the disc, you're pulling a digital download from their storefront because if you don't have the disc, they can sell it to you again. They monetize the program. And I don't blame them because it's a multi-year effort. It costs a lot of money and resources. And that's something where with PlayStation 3, yes, it's always been a problem because of its asymmetric multi-threaded architecture. It's not nearly as easy as people make it out to be. Um, and so for for Sony where they're a business, they just, it seems that they can't really justify it. Um, and then when we look at something like say our PCS3 where that's, you know, a community driven effort, right? They're primarily reverse engineering PS3 and arguably Sony can do it better and more reliably. That's true, but I still find they're a good example of like, hey, this is why emulation is hard, right? It takes years and not to say it's misleading, but when you go to their site and you see how many titles are playable, it's good, right? It's great that there's so many games that they boot, you can play them from start to finish, but the problem is that those games, many of those titles still have massive performance issues or frame rate drops. It's highly dependent on the computer that you're playing on. 
And you know, with community emulators, I mean, that's kind of the point, right? All that is out there. You can test, validate, try and you know help figure out what's wrong. That's the whole point of community emulation. But a console manufacturer is going to approach it differently. They're going to want to make sure the games are in a much more finished and polished state for uh, you know consumer release. And that's why oftentimes we see that you know emulators are either you know the games are relicensed or we have a, a whitelist program like Microsoft or it's just a, a really solid hit rate of 90 plus percent compatibility like PS3 is playing emulating PS1 games or just having the full SOC on the board so you have you know 99 percent compatibility more or less right I mean that's what a console manufacturer is going to do that's how they're going to approach it and that's why um if this were happening because the thing is we've never over the years um sure maybe you've seen rumors online or oh here's a patent and we've always been able to debunk them or here's a weird thing on psn why is it like this we've always been been able to you know look further into these things and, and debunk them we've never had anything really suggesting that they've looked into it or even started it but if they actually are now which i would assume is around when ps5 launched or maybe a little bit prior to the console officially coming out because they have that overhead now or at least uh, they might have the wiggle room to, the wiggle room to make it happen versus ps4 where that was not going to there was no chance it was happening on ps4 right so ps5 it, it could be a, a reality so i would love to know when they actually started this because that might dictate how long it could take if it's really going to happen um i would also love to know who Jeff Grubb, you know, talked to or looked into or who he asked. Um, we're not going to find that out either, but I would suspect it's certainly something where it falls back to a first party because uh, that's how they would, uh, that's how they would approach this as you have the core hardware team working very closely with a trusted first party that shipped PS3 games back in the day, especially first party because not only are they trusted, but you know, those are the only devs during the PS3 cycle that really utilized and flexed the cell processor the way it was meant to be utilized. So if you start with those games as a benchmark, then you might be able to build an emulator that works across the board for other third-party titles that maybe didn't use the cell processor nearly as much, right? All the different SPUs. It's something where if you start with first party, get those games to work as a baseline, you can approach it and start to validate problems from there and test, you know, games outside of first party but you would you would start with first party right and i would think they would approach either you know insomniac or even naughty dog with the ice team and start validating and, and looking at their you know their first ps3 titles that's how i i would suspect that they're actually going about doing it if it'll happen i would love for it to actually be a reality but it may take a very long time uh, we may only get a few titles at launch we we might not ever see it Again, the only solid counter argument I found is that, yeah, they can't use, you know, PS3 server blades forever, where that's principally PS3, you know, hardware. Uh, at some point, they have to do something or just pretend this library never existed, but I, I don't want them to do that. Nobody does. So we'll see, but at the very least, it's a little bit enlightening to hear one uh, person say, hey, I've looked into it. It seems like there might be something there perhaps over the years we'll get more evidence of that being true anyway moving on to our next story over on the official playstation podcast the sa president ceo jim ryan popped in to talk about uh, the upcoming ps plus uh, service revamp and he said some not really surprising things but something where uh, he mentioned that they have all the big publishers on board um, big publishers small indie developers um, they have a lot of big names attached to the to the service which really that applies to what we have today so that's why it's kind of like a Kind of a moot point right i mean we've got 800 games right now and that's why while it's still a bit strange how they're going from 800 to possibly 700 and the classic games are 340 which that was questionable and we talked about that mostly last week so that's still kind of up in the air but we still assume that the majority or at least a lot of these titles are rolling right into this uh tier system so it's not like they don't have a lot of big publishers and indies on board that's not really surprising uh, however he did mention and we've seen him reiterate this a few times now if it wasn't obvious the consolidation period is still ongoing so more is planned not only just organic growth and it's weird because when <laughs> it seems like they keep mentioning organic growth so often that people keep joking and poking fun at that word organic just i mean yeah it means when a studio that they currently own or 
fund from the ground up, it's something like that, or if a studio they own is expanding, more hiring, uh, they're splitting off into two or possibly three teams, you know, that's considered organic. Inorganic or indirect, you know, that's merger and acquisition, but he does say that more of those are planned, which, yeah, we knew that was coming. And that's the big question mark. Uh, the rumor last week was a major acquisition is coming sometime soon. And that's where it's like a really big question mark, especially because right now uh, we've seen that, you know, when it comes to rumor, speculation, I mean, no one really knows exactly, you know, what's being discussed behind the scenes or at least what name is being attached. So that's where it could get very surprising very soon because for PlayStation, it was fairly predictable. They've done long-standing close partners. It was more or less them tying the knot. Now it's getting to a point where we're seeing them and you know Microsoft obviously, but now they're doing these uh, you know bigger partners where it's surprising. It's causing a lot of conversation. I'm sure PlayStation will eventually get there, and I I really cannot wait to see what the next big name is. But I still suspect they'll do a lot of smaller deals that make sense for them and their bottom line. Because again, they don't quite have the capital Microsoft does. I'm sure there is a big one planned, but we could see you know a big one that's certainly questionable and you know, raises a lot of uh, arguments uh, about the acquisition at hand, but we'll have that alongside something like Arrowhead or uh, Camouflage, you know, smaller devs that have done PSVR things or possibly like Arrowhead does Helldivers, right? Those might make sense, uh, but we'll have that alongside a, a big one or possibly more big ones. Now, it's about time we get to some really good news, which is that Gamatsu is reporting that Stray was recently raided in Korea, implying that we might have a release date window or possibly a release date announcement uh, coming very soon. You know, games don't get raided unless they are coming out fairly soon, and that's a good indicator, so um, I'm excited. It's just something where I will be so bummed if one, the game's not good, but two, if it is good, uh, that it doesn't have a disc release, which I feel like this is gonna be gonna be one of those games where it doesn't at launch, but uh, somebody will eventually pick it up and uh, then it will come out, you know, later, a few months after, which I'm, I'm okay with. I mean, if a game, if I'm that excited for it, I usually buy it day one, no matter how it comes out. And then when it gets a desk, I'll pick that up just, you know, just because, keep it sealed, collect. And um, I'm fine with that for Stray, as long as it eventually gets a disc release. And also as long as it's really good, which I am praying it is easily going to be a game of the year contender. Um, I know Elden Ring is up there, but I think Stray is making a very compelling case, and I am so here for it. Next up, uh, we have the results for the 2021 BAFTA Game Awards, where Sony picked up uh, some more wins here. Uh, Ratchet & Clank won uh, Best Animation and also Technical Achievement. And then for Performer in a Leading Role, Jane Perry as Celine Vasos in Returnal won. That was so great to see. And also Returnal won Best Music, Audio Achievement, and also Best Game. Um, you know, I've said it before, but I'm just so proud of Housemark and how far they've come uh, doing the arcade games and transitioning to 3D bullet hell action and doing a narrative. It's just, um, it's so great to see, especially when it's not like the game, it's not like it didn't get the attention it deserved. I mean, understandably, it was only on PS5. It's very gameplay heavy focused where it's, you know, kind of punishing for a lot of people and it's a, a new IP, so it's not going to land nearly as well as something that's more established. Um, so obviously it's not reaching as many people as you know one would ideally like, but um, in terms of Sony's internal expectations, it seems to have done quite well. And at least for you know, Housemark where you know, they are acquired by Sony and uh, this project just sort of proves that uh, not only was that a good investment and a good partnership, but that uh, that can continue. And for all the awards that they've won, it's got to feel really good knowing that not only do uh, not only is the game resonating with people that are actually buying and playing it, but you know your creative peers around you in the same industry are seeing your work, recognizing it, and saying, "Hey, you know you did a really outstanding job, and we love what you've done here." That's got to feel really good for Housemark. And so once again, I'm just really proud of them, and this is why this game was my my personal uh, 2021 game of the year. Moving on to our next story, we've got some patches for some PlayStation Studio games. Uh, the first one being actually Astro's Playroom, which has not been patched in like over a year. So patch 1.7 recently dropped, uh, fixing some frame rate issues, uh, which were far and few between, but it looks like those were uh, fixed. Uh, some general performance and audio issues were sorted out. Um, so if you haven't played Astro yet, then now's the time. But I mean, really, you should have been playing this game a long time ago. 
doesn't take too long, but totally worth it. Uh, for Horizon Forbidden West, though, patch 1.11 recently dropped. Uh, again, a lot of changes, a lot of fixes. Uh, looks like they actually adjusted what was initially a nerf to the legendary weapons in the game, which I, I didn't notice, but I guess they uh, fixed that and sorted that out. I, it seems like that was actually a big issue for a lot of people. Also, elemental uh, hunter bows had this weird like reloading issue where it took a little bit longer. That one I definitely noticed. Um, but it's weird, in the patch notes, there's no longer a mention of the shimmering issue, which a lot of people are still encountering. So it's not like they maybe gave up on it, but I, I think it's something where whatever fix they have planned, they are really trying to sort this one out and it's taking much longer than expected. Um, but patch 1.11 for Gran Turismo 7, this is the one where it's making some adjustments to, well, it's increasing the credit payout for later races in the game. That's good. Increasing the overall amount of credits you can hold in the game from 20 to 100 million and uh, various other things as well. We can't go over, go over every single change log, but at least we're seeing some uh, noteworthy fixes for Gran Turismo and going in a better direction, which they you know outlined previously. So good to see that they're at least uh, sticking to it and perhaps they'll uh, over time really mold this game into, into a much better position than it was at launch and I would still love to see it not require online but that seems like a reach and that's not going to go away anytime soon but either way um, good fixes all around. Now moving on we have another interesting update on the Blue Box Game Studios uh, situation where uh, recently Colin Moriarty of Sacred Symbols and uh, formerly of IGN and Kinda Funny he recently had an hour-long interview with the Blue Box Game Studios uh, CEO and founder and that's where we finally got some answers but like not really so it's an hour-long conversation it's public I'll link it down below and it's really something where I recommend if you're that you know interested in it then by all means go ahead and watch that we can't even really like paraphrase what was said because not really a whole lot was said in that hour so it's really fascinating to see this conversation. You know, Colin asked a lot of the right things. Uh, oftentimes he asked the same question more than once and we didn't really get many straight answers directly from Hassan. Uh, a lot of side skirting, a lot of, you know, indirect, like, oh, well this kind of, but not really. Like he, it was weird, it was a very strange <laughs> interview. Let's just put it that way. Um, so certain things he was, you know, quite candid with. More notably, just how he handled uh, the game getting announced in general, talking about the PS blog and uh, some misnomers about Jason Schreier's original report when he talked to him, right? So there's actually a decent amount of things in there, but uh, I think the most important thing to really walk away from it is that it's just this is clearly a game that doesn't really have a whole lot of funding. Um, and that's the one thing that Hassan explained is that the preview you know, game experience that he's going to be launching... Uh, soon as an hour two hour long experience that'll be priced under $15 and that's supposed to fund the full game That they want to eventually release and it just it seems quite clear that This is a studio that doesn't really have a lot of people or funding for that matter and it still seems a little weird and completely bizarre and you know It's not at all what people were initially thinking and look I don't really blame people initially when it popped up, right? It was a fascinating weird thing. I was never fully convinced but it was just something where it's like there were so many weird little things and references and people were just digging and finding weird connections that lined up in a very strange way and that's why this studio got so much attention and then Hassan himself didn't really do you know this game and this small studio any favors by the way he handled it right so that's why it's a fascinating situation but of course there's the, now there's the other angle of it of like let's stop giving this guy attention let's stop giving this game attention Regardless, it's obvious why it was a fascinating thing to begin with and with this interview it's weird because it, it kind of leaves even more questions than answers despite this being the most candid and open conversation from Hassan that we've seen so far but either way it's out there now um, but this might be one of the final updates that we have for a while assuming that he does stay quiet starts working on the game and perhaps eventually something actually comes out that's tangible and we could per and we can perhaps talk about uh, but who knows when that day will come now with all that said it is time for let's talk plus uh, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. You can follow the link down below. Supporting this channel, a number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games.
Those are all the stories that I wanted to talk about with you all from this past week. And our Tuesday video was PS Vita Online in 2022. Uh, who's still playing and why? So uh, we do that around March or April, so we were due. And uh, you can go check out this year's results. Obviously Vita's in a bit of a different scenario versus PS3, but by all means, uh, go take a look at where that system is now sitting in terms of online communities. But uh, coming up as always, something else on Tuesday as per usual, and that is it. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Benecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.